I'm now to introduce you to our Tourism Leaders Panel. Uh, please welcome to the stage Paul Kelly, uh, who's been CEO of Fall to Ireland for the last seven years. Alice Manser, who's just completed her first year as CEO of Tourism Ireland. Mary Considine, a CEO of the Shannon Airport Group. Uh, economist Jim Parr, who I uh, don't need to introduce you to. And of course, Anne O'Donoghue, who is, amongst other things, the CEO of the Irish Heritage Trust. You're all very, uh, very welcome. <laughs> Jim Parr, I'm going to start with you. Um, you put me on the far right for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what can I say, Jim? <laughs> I want to ask you about, because um, I, sort of, I sort of have this kind of horror from uh, 2007, 2008, but the boom is kind of getting boomier in many respects, or at least in the headline uh, respects. Should we be getting worried? Jesus, I wouldn't be the one to ask. Um, with my record. <laughs> with my record. No, um, I, if, if you look at the aggregate statistics yeah. for Ireland, they're really good. Uh, you know, the exchequer returns are absolutely on fire. You know, last year, 83 billion. This year, we're probably going to hit 95 billion tax revenues. And it's coming from VAT, it's coming from income tax, it's coming from corporation tax. Um, the employment situation. Apple tax. Apple tax absolutely. <laughs> Don't knock it. Um, the labour market is on fire, you know, 4.3% unemployment rate, which is virtually full employment, obviously creating serious challenges for the people in this audience. Particularly, uh, we have 2.7 million people working in the country, which is the highest level ever. So there's a lot of stuff that's really positive about Ireland. But there are, there are the challenges, you know, and, and one of the challenges is I guess is the the cost of doing business and the cost of living that has been spoken about today so far by a number of speakers. Um, you know, the reality is while our inflation rate is now back down from a high of 9.2 in October 22 to 1.7% um, at the moment, but the inflation rate is decelerating, but yet the cost of living today is about 21% higher than it was three years ago. And for mortgage holders, mortgage costs are 89% higher. Uh, accommodation is about 40% higher. Restaurants eating out about 23% higher. So there's a legacy of that inflationary spike that is really, course, the, the, the big that's, with high that's really impacting on the yeah. consumer side of the economy. So for any consumer facing business out there and I think the restaurant sector has been at the cutting edge. You're dealing with a challenged consumer in many cases and, and margins are being squeezed. And Alice, um, obviously visitor numbers up, you know, air access up, but so too are costs. So has it been mixed? Well, yeah, I mean, so many experts here in the room with us, but if I try and sum up the picture of where we're at, looking at both the overall tourism data and then some of the lived experience on the ground um, that we hear about from industry. Uh, on the one hand, you've got visitors, spend per trip and revenue up year over year from overseas per CSO. But if you look underneath the surface, it's a more complex picture than that because even though uh, you've got more visitors coming in, they're spending a little bit lo less uh, long with us. So for example, instead of spending eight days on average last year, they're spending seven days on average this year. And so when you balance out more visitors, but spending slightly less long, actually overnight stays or bed nights are flat this year. And then that spend that we talked about or the increased revenue, well, it feels quite thinly spread, I think, this year for a couple of reasons. One, it's that topic of costs going up, the cost of doing business going up, um, and hence that eats into profitability and sometimes even viability. Um, and the other point is that we've got a little bit more accommodation stock this year than we did last year, which is really positive news in the long term, maybe 5% more hotel beds in Dublin, 2 to 3% around the rest of the country. But again, it means the visitors and the revenue are a little bit more thinly spread this year than they were last year, which feeds into um, industry players not always seeing all the benefits. And all of it goes to strengthen our resolve in Tourism Ireland to do a great job telling the story overseas, drumming up demand to meet the supply that we now have and, and helping everybody here in the industry by bringing the visitors in.
Yeah, because well, like, I mean, most finance ministers would love to be in the position that Jack Chambers is in, just in terms of what they have at their back, in terms of you know public spending, a potential giveaway budget, and putting monies towards a really day fund. But as Al said, there's a lot of moving parts, and I did say to the ministry this morning that it is that sort of that cumulative effect of all of these reforms that are, in particular, adding to the to the labour costs. Um, how how is it impacting you know lo locally and domestically on the tourism sector? All of those complex factors. Is that you? That's you? Me? Oh, me. Sorry. Not paying attention. <laughs> Not paying attention. There's always one. No, <laughs> I was like, are we going to talk? <laughs> Alice, afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, look, uh, you know, I suppose just, just to add to the state of uh, Alice summed up the position uh, brilliantly with regards to overseas visitors. I think just to add to that, domestic is also an important part of the tourism economy. And, and domestic, certainly, you know, in terms of we have, we don't have the data yet from CSO, but all of the anecdotal stuff is that it has been significantly challenged uh, this year. The weather, obviously, was with, with the late booking pattern of domestic tourism, the weather across the summer uh, certainly was a was 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 a downer on, on the effect. Also, a lot of the increased air capacity, we we are seeing a higher percentage of the air seats being outbound. Um, uh, domestic uh, domestic visitors going outbound than uh, than they were pre-COVID. Uh, so you know, in terms of that, that certainly um, uh, certainly has, has, has challenged us, uh, challenged the sector across this year um, as well. So I suppose in terms of yeah, but you know, in terms of our, our tourism barometer that we've we published there recently clearly showed that those uh, that are no flood of businesses. Are, um, are 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 not seeing um, you know they're they're not seeing significant revenue increases. Their vast majority of business are seeing profit margins significantly squeezed because of the because of the impact of of, of all of the various cost and pressures that uh, uh, that Jim outlined. Um, so um, you know it certainly is, uh, but I think it's important you know as well that we don't you know that as an industry you know that we that we don't kind of talk ourselves down too much. You know, we need to have confidence in the industry and we need to portray that confidence to into the wider economy as well. So I know there's a, there's a lot of challenges out there, but it's important that we don't over we don't kind of over egg them as well. I know kind of we're in pre budget time and all that sort of stuff, and there are an awful lot, there are often awful lot of pre sectors, particularly the food sector, uh, that is that is significantly challenged. But you know, in terms of, it's important we keep balance in that as well. Of course, the tourism sector isn't a, a monolith. There within it, each has, has their own challenges. And um, Avea Etik, uh, the Irish Heritage Trust, you're wearing a number. Um, of hats today, but it gives you something of a, a bird's eye view. And I'm just wondering from the, just picking up on Paul's point there, on the best of times, worst of times spectrum, um, where do you think we're sitting? Probably, um, I think wearing an AVI and Irish Church Trust hat and therefore an Itic hat as well. I'd have to say it's probably been from my perspective, the most challenging year in the last six. Uh, when the pandemic happened, supports were provided incredibly quickly, easy to use, you know, and really, I think, made a huge difference to so many businesses that are represented throughout this room. We're still, I think, so because we're still behind 2019 numbers, um, and because I think a lot of visitor attractions like the ones in Irish Heritage Trust, are not actually located in large urban conurbations. Yeah, they're... The typical tourism season, which runs, you know, kind of mid-March through September, has been a tough one this year for all the reasons that have already been outlined, not least of which weather. And so with soft, certain soft international markets combined with last out, turn off the lights because of the weather, <laughs> the outbound traffic. Um, it's, you know, there, there are a lot of visitor attractions and experienced businesses, particularly those in rural locations, who have come off the back of a really hard summer season. Mm. But it's the summer that carries the winter costs. And so for many people, this is a really challenging time. So I was thrilled personally to hear Minister Martin say this morning that the government wants to bring the right supports, you know, you know, and direct them to where they're needed. Yeah, and obviously, uh, and obviously yeah. accessing those supports when they're there yeah. is really critical. Uh, Mary, the Shannon Airport Group is quite literally flying it uh, at present. Um, you've had a brilliant, brilliant uh, bounce back post uh, COVID. So what's the proverbial burning platform for the Shannon Airport Group at the minute? First of all, thanks to Ervila and good afternoon, everyone. I suppose for us, we are, we're very pleased with the numbers. As I had said earlier on, we're up 7% year to date. So that's really good, a good bounce back. 
But I think, you know, we're very ambitious for the group and very ambitious for the role that the airport in particular can play in the national economy. And, you know, we've heard here today that 70 percent of the jobs in tourism are outside the capital. And if the jobs are out there, that's where people want to go and that's where people are spending. So we need to make sure that we have the air access into the regions to, to further that growth and to support it going forward. And I suppose at a time, you know, we've heard this afternoon about the constraints, particularly with the CAP in Dublin Airport. The CAP exists today. So it's not an either or, it's how we can come together and provide solutions. And at a time when we've underutilised capacity in the airports outside of, of the capital, uh, when we today could take an additional 3 million passengers, and we know that 40% of the tourists coming through Dublin Airport are going straight down how, how to the S. How do you that? Because Kenny and yeah. Donal are quite strong that it's just not that easy. It's just not a marketing thing. You can't do it. But how, how do we, I suppose the question I was asking them was, how do we divert or divest some of that market share? Well, I suppose, again, if you look at the country, having 86% of all aviation going through one airport is putting huge reliance on that critical airport infrastructure. And nobody is disputing that Dublin isn't critical to the economy, that it's not a hub airport. But there's a lot of other traffic going through that is congesting it. And, you know, we talk about 40% of the tourists coming into the country. We layer on top of that the businesses. For example, there's 50% of the foreign direct investment within our catchment area. So they are not only getting their goods and people to market, but that spend for our whole hospitality sector by people coming into the country, their board of directors coming in, their investors coming in, and they want to stay closer to where those businesses are and they want the air access. So I think there's a couple of crucial things. We work very closely with Tourism Ireland and Alice and her team there on the cooperative marketing spend to support that air access into the regions. We need to be very competitive to allow our airline partners to continue to grow and we are and I, I think it, it's all of that together. We need to improve the public transport infrastructure. So there are things that we can do today to improve things, but there is a huge opportunity. And going back to 86%, that is complete over-reliance on one, one critical infrastructure. Anything goes wrong, as we've seen recently, you know, the whole thing grinds to a halt and that's not good for the country. And just on that, Alice, I, mean, they, I suppose that it's a complex issue, but the passenger cap speaks a whole load of issues, it's not just planning and everything and slots, but it also speaks that balancing act, I think that you touched on a little bit earlier, of that you're trying to manage and grow revenue overseas, that is government policy and strategy, and everyone in this room wants that, but it's managing the revenue per carbon footprint. And I'm just wondering, are those two mutually exclusive or how can we achieve both? Yeah, it's a great question. So I feel like access and sustainability are two real topics of the day, as they should be. Um, and I suppose, you know, we are an island, as has been said many times. Um, but if you look at uh, tourism on the island, over two thirds of the revenue comes from overseas visitors. So to care for our tourism industry, we have to care for how we bring inbound visitors to us. And 90% of people will come by air. As we've heard for Ireland, 86% of the air capacity is coming into Dublin today. Island-wide, inclusive of Northern Ireland, it's about 70%. So there's no two ways about it. The cap does need to be reviewed and it's really positive to hear everybody's commitment across the stakeholders to review it as fast as can be reviewed within the process. But at the same time, to Mary's point, we want to mitigate in any way we can while that's happening. Um, so we're working really closely with the airports and the airlines where there are commercially viable routes that can go into the regions or Northern Ireland to help support demand and keep those healthy through cooperative marketing. We also want to make sure that the planes coming into Dublin have their fair share of inbound visitors on them. And we want to think about spend per trip to make sure they're the most valuable visitors. But uh, going back to your point on yes. sustainability and the, the tension there, I mean, there is an innate tension in that there's a carbon footprint associated with bringing people to the island. Um, and I think it, it's more than a topic for us, it's a topic for everybody around the world. And if you look at the EU position on this, there's a goal of getting to 70% sustainable aviation fuel usage by 2050. Now, I'll caveat that by saying that is a big bet, it's not a sure bet, because there's an awful lot of development that needs to happen along the way. But meanwhile, we've heard the airlines are working on um, better engines and technology. We have an opportunity on sustainable sustainable aviation fuel. I know Mary feels really strongly about opportunities at Shannon on that. And within Tourism Ireland, we are focusing on those segments and markets that when they come can bring the most benefit to 
societies and communities around the island so that you're balancing out as much as you can, getting the maximum benefit, the maximum revenue for any carbon footprint that's generated. And, and Paul, just on that, like, I mean, you do have to fly here to be here. We're an island nation and some people say, well, we can't apologise for the fact that you have to fly here uh, to be here. Um, but what are we chasing? Is it volume or value or both? You know, because that's another part of the sustainability yeah. fine uh, balancing act. Well, I think it is, it is, it is benefit to, the, to Ireland, benefit to the Irish economy, benefit to Irish society. And, you know, in terms of what the, the easiest way to measure that, that benefit is value. It's not volume, you know, in terms of because when we model it out and we look at it, the, it is the money that leads to the jobs, that leads to the healthy communities, you know, in terms of, so the more, the, the more revenue we can get per kilogram of carbon that's consumed and getting here, the better, the better we will do, the more sustainable we can be. I think it's important as well, you know, in terms of that we don't think as, we don't just kind of go, well, sustainability, that's somebody else's problem over there. There is a huge amount that we can do as an industry here on the island to make sure that, you know, in terms of that we are as sustainable a destination as we can be when people get here. Uh, and we've got to work with all the airlines and the international partners, et cetera, to, to make sure getting here is as sustainable as possible. But we can't just leave that over there. And we are delighted that we've had really good industry engagement on the Climate Action Programme that we launched this year. I think we've about 150 businesses now signed up to that. And we're working with the Sustainable Energy Authority to help uh, smooth the process of getting grants into businesses, but also all of the things that people can do without grants in order to make their businesses more sustainable. So staying on that journey and everybody saying, how can I make my business, my operation more sustainable is a key thing that we need, that we need to do. And of course, it's a whole big uh, uh, question question and discussion around kind of the, the costs of doing that and for businesses and is actually reporting mechanisms, CSRD, et cetera, making that more difficult. Mary, how are you um, at Shannon squaring that sustainability um, circle? And, you know, and a lot of the businesses are saying we are going to need support as well for this transition. Sometimes I think, well, the big PLCs can handle it. But, but even, for, even for the bigger players, things like CSRD and that kind of what's cascading down through the whole um, of the, the economy or the tourism sector is, is a, it's a challenge as well. It is, but I suppose it's a challenge we have to, to grasp because climate change isn't going away. It's a serious issue for, for our planet. So if you look at our own business, we're obviously doing everything we can to green our own operation. We have our sustainability plans in place to achieve our own targets. Um, but you're rightly so. It, it's a big piece of work. And obviously, any government supports that can be put in place to help businesses go through that transition will be really important. Um, but even for ourselves, even if we green our own operation, our airport operation, and then put the infrastructure in place to help our airline partners, for example, we've just got planning for a solar PV farm on the airfield to help reduce our own carbon greenhouse gases. The, the airlines themselves are, are, you know, are the most significant element of, of the, the, the carbon chain there. So, as Alice mentioned there, I think there's a huge opportunity for Ireland Inc. to really look at SAF production, that's sustainable aviation fuel. The mandated targets will start to kick in for airlines for next year. And I think, again, if we look at uh, holistically as a country, what the opportunity is here with offshore wind and green energy, which is a key component, green hydrogen for, fuel, for sustainable aviation fuels, there is a real opportunity here. And back to, you know, we're all talking about tourism today. We're an island nation. We have to help our, our aviation sector to decarbonise. And I think this is the most critical thing that we need to and look at as a country. Globe, especially when globally it's, it's growing. It's growing it's and growing. the demand is growing. Yeah, yeah. demand is growing. And, um, and I just want to ask you, look, I mean, uh, I know when I first started having conversations about sustainability, it sort of meant one thing, you know, and it has, you know, it was environment, but it has changed so much. It is, yeah. I think, as we were chatting with uh, both uh, Kenny and Donal earlier, it is financial sustainability, yeah. it is about the social, it is about yeah. community and increasingly because everybody is now getting allergic to the a phrase ESG, but you know it's it's now actually seeing pressure for companies to incorporate human rights um, and everything into uh, their reporting and their and their DNA. For the heritage sector, what does it mean and, and how has that evolved um, mm. for you? Probably one, uh, one extension point to what's been said already by Mary and referenced by Paul, we are an island nation. But when we did our carbon footprint uh, under scope three, you know, which is obviously not so much within our direct control, but it's part of the calculation, by far and away country miles, how our visitors get to us is the biggest single input into carbon 
right, and to the, the carbon calculation. Not just when they get on the island, but actually particularly for heritage when they get to when you. They, in in yeah. coming to us, because of, we're in predominantly rural locations. So that leads to needing, by the way, a really well-developed, um, you know, transport infrastructure, um, you know, and a road infrastructure and, and, you know, developing multiple, you know, methods of getting to us where hopefully the shared journey becomes part of the experience. And so we want to try and work with others to, and collaboration has been mentioned several times today. So that's really important. But there are particular challenges for heritage visitor attractions. And I use that term deliberately because we look at ourselves commercially through the lens of tourism, because the majority of visitors come to us because they want to have an experience, an authentic experience. Um, in terms of our own sustainability strategy, it does embrace the three pillars of environment, of community and social, and of course, of economic viability. That's particularly important to us because we're a non-profit. We reinvest everything back into the properties in our care. And I suppose so for us, the challenges are broadly around things like retrofitting. Heritage buildings, uh, sadly, you know, they don't have their wonderful BER ratings. Um, and that costs? That comes at quite the price, OK? But I'm an optimist at heart, you know, because I think there is a, co a, co a combination of solutions here. One, the old adage of how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. Um, most of these great big, seemingly unachievable objectives, they can be broken down, right? And they can be done over time. And one of the things we often say when we present to our visitors is we're proudly a work in progress. You know, every time you come, we're on a sustainability journey. Fault to Ireland had some research done, I think earlier this year only, where more than 50% of visitors, they want evidence of a sustainability journey at visitor attractions. So I think, you know, in Ireland, I know John mentioned it earlier very powerfully and said, you know, that our soft power, I think our soft power extends to be having an authentic voice as well, where we collaborate with each other to co-promote, to, to bring the visitor in a sustainable manner to where we are. And then they spend longer and they enjoy slow tourism. Jim, can I ask you, uh, it's interesting, no date has yet been set uh, for the finance um, bill uh, in respect of the forthcoming um, budget. I don't know if that means they'll automatically go to the park um, yeah. and seek a mandate there. But just in terms of the budget um, and what Ireland is going to need in terms of our national infrastructure over, uh, we look at the National Development Plan, 50,000 houses a year. You know, we're nowhere obviously near that target yet. Everything about this and planning for the, that seven million on the island of Ireland, possibly rising to more, is all going to be about spend and build and investment, whether it's in hospitals, schools. What's that going to do for the climate action plan when everything is growth and getting bigger? Well, I, I guess the, the answer to the degrowth argument is, you know, try going 10 years without growth and see where you end up. Mm -hmm. You end up like the UK at the moment, where on many metrics, and John was talking about it this morning, and the book he's written is about it, um, you know, it has massive infrastructure problems after years of under, underinvestment. So you cannot go a degrowth strategy, you know, but you have to try and make sure that every percentage growth you get in GDP is as carbon friendly as possible. So that's the whole environmental and sustainability uh, pathway we're on, um, the Paris Accord, you know, the various targets. That's what we're working towards. That's what the every iteration of the Climate Action Plan is about. And we've got to continue to push that. But we cannot stop growth. And if you do, as I say, try 10 years without and you'll see what life will be like. OK, um, in the budget, they, which has been presented next Tuesday, um, they have a lot of money to play with. Um, th th there was obviously, I think, going to be a up to 12 billion package fully. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of smoke and mirrors going on with yep. what the package is going to be. But I think it's going to be about 12 billion plus, the largest ever fiscal package delivered, OK? And on top of that, then, we have the debate about the 14 billion. My worry is that what we're going to see next Tuesday, which is typical of every budget in this country in recent years, is going to be short term politically driven. There will not be a long-term strategy. They talk about business support schemes for the but, tourism. But, but isn't that what we, the electorate, want? Look at all Sorry, the, can I... Can I isn't that what the opinion polls want? Isn't that what we tell them? We want that retail politics. Uh, yeah, well, okay. 
<laughs> well, maybe, not, maybe. Not, not, not as personally, but that's yeah, you know, yeah. They, but see, we politicians, want that giveaway. politicians have to lead. They have to show leadership, and leadership is long-term investment in the growth potential of the economy. I mean, the reason why we're talking about support packages for businesses, particularly in this sector, is because last September, in an act of madness, they increased the VAT rate from 9 to 13.5%. And it wasn't the VAT increase per se that was the biggest problem, but it came on top of a whole load of other pressures. All of the labour legislation, the minimum wage, the move towards the living wage, all of that stuff, energy costs, you know, the cost of doing business for the sector has increased dramatically in the last three years. In the middle of that, you increased the VAT rate. And it, to me, it was nuts. I said it at the time, and I think exactly. we, we are seeing the consequences now. So, but that's the approach we're going to get. It's going to be a scattergun approach. We're all going to wake up the following morning slightly better off. There will be very little investment in long-term growth potential. I mean, the metro to Dublin Airport, in my view, is an absolute disgrace. Um, you know, the fact that it hasn't been developed uh, and, and generally around infrastructure, around housing, around public services, because we cannot forget that infrastructure is becoming the most important element of our national yeah. competitors because our corporation tax advantages are being whittled away. And the OECD was out this morning, yeah. again, talking about the pillar one being implemented. So, so, so we need to make sure that for multinational investors, for visitors to this country as tourists, that the infrastructure is as strong as possible. World class is where we should be aiming. And if we stop spending on it, that's not where we're going. Paul, um, obviously we were here for the Minister this morning. We didn't get too much of a, a hint of what might be the targeted business supports for the sector in lieu of the 9% VAT, which I think we can take is that that's not going to change. How are we going to make sure that those supports, when they're announced, are adequately cascaded to those most in need within the sector? Oh, gosh. I, that's going to be above my pay grade, to be honest, you know, in terms of because that, that will be a matter for government uh, to, uh, you know, to figure out what is the, you know, what, what's, uh, what's, what, you know, what, what's, what's required across, across an across economy basis. Uh, you know, like, I'd like, like, you know, everyone, everyone, everyone in the tourism sector, we'd like to see, you know, the, the taxes, including the VAT rate, as low as it can be for the tourism sector. And we'd like to see the investment as high as it can be in the tourism sector. But we're coming at it from a tourism spe sector perspective, as opposed to, you know, the minister, ministers for finance and public expenditure have to look at, at, the, at, the, entire, at the entire economy. Um, you know, I think just, I suppose, to, to come back to some of the points, you know, that, that Jim was making, it was made earlier, you know, and the conference theme of responsible ambition, you know, growth is absolutely essential, you know, in terms of whether you're running, whether we want to, I think, you know, Kenny art articulated it very well in terms of that, uh, and, and Donald, Donald in terms around, you know, if you've got growth, you've got money to invest. If you're in a declining scenario, uh, you know, you're, everything is a battle, everything's a fight in any business when you've got growth, you can make things happen. You can, and particularly in terms of in terms of the investment required on sustainability and and becoming uh, and be, you know uh, becoming more um, closer to carbon neutral, etc. We need growth to do that. All of the businesses need growth in order to invest in the sustainability issues. Whether that's you know whether that's hotels or visitor attractions or airlines or airports. So you know I think it's and it's important I suppose that we do as an industry, you know. Um, you know, make sure that point is understood, that responsible ambition does entail growth. Uh, and I know ourselves and Tourism Ireland and ITIC are all pretty much lined up on, we need to see about 5 to 6% year-on-year average growth in revenue in order to be economically sustainable and have the space to invest. And we know in terms of that if we can get everything right on the carbon reduction initiatives, that can be compatible with our uh, with the government's climate action targets, uh, if we uh, can get everything yeah. else. And right you're well. nodding your head in agreement there. Um, given that, how do you think the regions then can maximise those opportunities? Was yeah. that to me? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah. I think in terms of the regions maximising the opportunities. Well, I, I do think, and I know uh, Oliver had something to say about it earlier. But I think having somewhere like Ireland's hidden heartlands is amazing if you can combine that with both regional access, whether it's you know, um, and a, and, a, and a developed road infrastructure, because you know, at the moment, really, the only way to do it is drive. 
you know, the majority of visitors arrive by car. I think, um, you know, what we're doing ourselves, for example, is we're joining hands with multiple other activity providers, accommodation providers and so on. We're trying to be more coherent and cohesive, working together to make, you know, to really make it a destination experience. I think we need lots more of that. And I know, uh, apologies, Paul, I don't mean to sound like I'm working for Falcha Ireland, but I've seen some of the DDP plans coming into play and that's exactly what they seek to do over a five year time horizon. We've got to have those, we've got to implement them, we've got to focus on them. And, and I think collaboration and communication across the wider community is absolutely essential and, in the implementation of those. And actually, I actually want to just, in, in the few minutes we've left, just to bring that issue of community up with all of the panel. Like, I mean, all across the world this year, mm. we have seen fight back against communities, against um, over tourism, whether it is in Spain mm. or Greece or, you know, elsewhere. And, you know, we've seen perhaps complaints about dynamic pricing and things going up, you know, at, at our own location, other locations. And I'm just wondering, Alice, how do we... Um, how, how, how do we listen and value the voice of those communities and bring them on the journey of responsible tourism, both in terms of them being citizens who travel themselves, but also whose homes and towns and, and cities can be targets for over tourism? And, and, you see, and we've seen very, very strong pushback in, in, in certain cities and areas. Yeah, I mean, over-tourism has absolutely been a headline across Europe this year. Revenge uh, you know, uh, Yeah, you had revenge tourism after COVID and then people thought, well, is there too much tourism? And you had taxes in Venice or um, protests in Barcelona or in the Canaries. Now, I don't think we're in that place. Um, when you survey communities, nine out of 10 people say, tourism on balance is good for my community. And our visitors, over half of them, have already recommended to others that they come to Ireland. So we're in quite a positive place in terms of community support, visitor support, but we don't take that for granted. And it's all about getting the right regional and seasonal spread, that it's not just a couple of hotspots um, that benefit from tourism, but that it's spread around the regions and seasons. And that's a big focus of our marketing in Tourism Ireland. Um, at the moment, for example, we've got a travel show live with Dermot O'Leary on ITV in Great Britain that we co-produced where he's traveling around Cork, Kinsale, Wexford, where he has roots, Belfast, Dublin, showcase the food and the landscape. Um, our Home of Halloween campaign is live. We love this one because it's rooted in culture. Halloween is a favourite moment around the world, but it started 2,000 years ago in Celtic culture here. So we're telling that origin story and then connecting it to the wonderful festivals like Derry Halloween, Puka, Machnas in Galway, um, and Puka is in Meath, of course, Bram Stoker. So if you can inspire visitors to come in to different parts of the island and at different times of year, you keep this really lovely balance that it's useful to everybody and we know that for every one euro that we spend on marketing an estimated 25 euros comes back into the economy in terms of overseas visitor spend so we're really committed to getting that regional and seasonal spread and mary you would kind of say this wouldn't you but um you'd be happy to see more people going to the regions and you know getting out of the capital spending longer times and particularly in the the shoulder season or, or other times so how do we really 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 boost that and maximize it as well so I think there's a huge opportunity for the country because when we talk about climate change, I think we have a really temperate climate here. So Ireland is increasingly becoming an all, an all year round destination. Um, and I think it's about doing it in a balanced, sustainable way. So if you look at the fantastic work the Falch Ireland do on the Wild Atlantic Way, we have the Hidden Heartlands. So I think we have the product there. It's about having the access and putting the infrastructure and the public transport in place to make it easy to get there. But I think there's a, there's a real opportunity and it's looking at that balanced growth. I think we all accept that we need to continue to grow. We need to continue to invest but it's how we grow and we need to grow in a more balanced way. And I suppose that's one of the arguments that we've been increasingly making is if you look at the ambition under Project Ireland 2040, it's for a balanced national economy. Um, air access and, and airport infrastructure is critical to that. And indeed it's public transport and investment in our regions and in our housing. So I think it's now about how like the economy is strong. It's how we spend the money to put that infrastructure in place and to make sure that we haven't an over-reliance on any area, that we haven't over-tourism in any area, that there's a balance and a distribution. And that will be good for the whole country. Yeah, and Jim, finally, just to bring you in on that, it's not uh, uh, how you spend, it's also where you spend. Um, notwithstanding like the, you know, what the government has available to it, I mean, there are a lot of demands 
on that? Do you think there's a risk that tourism might fall down the investment agenda or what do they do, need to do to keep it out and foremost in terms well, of... Well, I, I think there is an economic imperative because um, one of the big problems we face as a country is concentration risk. You know, we have a massive dependence on multinational investment. Ten companies account for 54% of corporation tax, for example. So we need to develop our indigenous industries. And there are two which are closely related, uh, tourism and the agri-food sector. So there has to be targeted investment in both those sectors to help them develop in a sustainable way. And I think balanced regional economic development is a key part of avoiding the over-tourism problem. Um, and in that context, you know, the stuff coming down the tracks, that worries me a bit. Uh, the minister, in the few occasions she spoke about tourism this morning, rather than the arts, she actually, um, the, the short-term letting bill. I mean, if they follow through with the logic of what they're suggesting, they are going to destroy the accommodation offering in rural areas where there's not hotel accommodation. So that's actually going to further concentrate tourism in areas where there's a lot of accommodation. So I think we need to be very careful with the sorts of strategies. And I think, you know, the short term letting sector is being scapegoated for government failure in the delivery of housing, for example. You know, so it's an EU measure. So, you know, we have to we have to live with it. When oh, I know it's, comes, a, I, yeah. I, well, sorry, some of it is a neat yeah. new measure. The registration yeah. is, but not taking yeah. short-term um, letting mm -hmm. off, off the market. Yeah. And over 10,000 short-term properties have been identified as suitable for long-term ac rental accommodation. And if you take 10,000 out of the accommodation offering, you're going to destroy mm -hmm. rural tourism. Well, you want to come in there? Yeah, if, I, if I can come in, uh, you know, in, in fairness, I think we need, you know, we need to have, have, have balance. There's a little bit of scaremongering going on there, Jim, to be honest, you know, in terms of, you know, one of the... Oh, well, no, no, let me... If they take out 10,000 short-term letting properties in the tourism sector, I don't think that's scaremongering. Well, if, if the majority of them are in urban areas to say that it's going to destroy rural tourism, I don't see how that works. So, you know, let me, let me just... Well, they're I mean, talking about 1,800 in Kerry, for can, example. Yeah, sorry. Can, can we just... I mean, there, there's, you know, in terms of... In the context of over-tourism, we've got to develop tourism in a way that is consistent with the wider community needs. And one of the major issues that's leading to a backlash against tourism is the lack of housing for residents in various cities around, around Europe in terms of, and that's one of the, and as everyone here in the tourism industry knows, finding accommodation for staff is incredibly difficult. And that's making cost of businesses going up. So it's got to be developed in balanced in an appropriate way. And, you know, as the minister said this morning, the planning guidelines are essential in this regard because it's got to be done. It's got to be done correctly. But at the moment we have tour, we have people living in hotels and guest houses that were built for tourists and we have tourists and we have yeah. tour and we have yeah. and we have tourists in flats and apartments that were yeah. built for residents. It is. So, you know, and, and, and creating, in some instances, creating issues. So, you know, this is an area that does need to be grown responsibly. And we do need to have responsible amb ambition in terms of how the short term lets areas grow. And there, there needs to be, you know, in terms of there needs to be appropriate uh, development in this. Uh, and this will be essential to tourism staying seen as a positive force for good within within yeah, society and, and, so i think that's and, and, you know it was really important any tensions between the community and those who are coming to business absolutely i'm afraid that is all we have time for uh, but uh, i think i think the answer to the overall question can you, you have responsible growth uh, and uh, reduce the carbon footprint i think that was a unanimous yes yeah. yeah i'll take it that it was but to jim and mary to alice and to paul thank you very very much and that was our leaders panel thank you um, thank you very very much i'll let you all head this way great stuff thank you